Alrighty. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's Legal Value Network webinar. I am Christian Stevenson, an associate for LVN. Before we get started, I would like to go through a few housekeeping notes. Today's session will be recorded and we are using Zoom webinar. Therefore, attendees will be muted. We do encourage you to use the Q&A feature to ask the presenters questions throughout the webinar and use the chat box feature to interact with other attendees. The opinions expressed during today's webinar are solely the panelists and do not express the views or opinions of the respective employers. Now, I would like to in introduce our moderator for today's session, Chief Knowledge Services Officer at Jason Walker. LLP and co-founder of Three Geeks and a Law Blog and host of the Geek and Review podcast, Greg Lambert. Thanks, Christian. Hi, everybody. Uh, i got a very exciting panel uh, to talk about today, and I'm thrilled to moderate uh, the discussion on the impact of generative AI on the legal industry uh, with such a, a great group of thought leaders. Um, I want to first thank uh, the Legal Value Network for hosting this panel discussion and, of course, to Cherry Beckert for sponsoring uh, so that so many uh, people who signed up could attend this. Uh, um, to get more content like this, and, and I would highly encourage everyone to uh, to attend, to register for the LVNX uh, conference in Chicago. At that conference, uh, you know, we'll feature a, a number of sessions on trust, on talent, data, diversity, and, and a lot more, including uh, more about the, this discussion. And it'll be led by a, a number of experts and innovators in the legal field, law firms, in-house counsel, uh, legal departments, service providers. Uh, attendees of LVNX can expect uh, to learn from passionate peers, uh, gain valuable insights, and discover new solutions for the challenges and opportunities facing the legal industry. Uh, the conference itself will take place in Chicago, starting with the pre-conference on September 20th, and will run through September 22nd. Um, and it at the end, I will actually be hosting another panel at the closing session featuring more practical applications for generative AI and in the, in the legal industry. And that will include uh, panelists like Dan Lena from Northwestern University, Aaron Borsma from Google, and a lot more. So I hope to see everybody there. So let's jump into today's discussion. Uh, first, we have my good friend, Toby Brown, who's the CEO of Deviate Legal Strategies, an LVN board member, and according to a, uh, a recent article, a self-proclaimed uh, pricing expert. So, Toby, uh, uh, welcome, and thanks for uh, doing this. He has so many other skills, but I think that's how I'm going to introduce him. Uh, we also have Chris Sakunas, uh, Director of Strategic Counseling at Council Link by LexisNexis. Chris works with corporate legal departments to help them take advantage of data to improve process and decision making. Hi, Chris. Next up is uh, Ryan McLeod, a principal at Sente Advisors, who advises law firms on emerging technologies and streamlining processes. We could all use Ryan's help. So Hi, Ryan. <laughs> and finally, we have Nita Sanger from Cherry Beckard Advisory LLC. Uh, Nita works with law firms on uh, digital transforming their business and will provide a perspective on execution strategy for law firms uh, with a focus on people, processes, technology, and culture issues that would need to be addressed. Uh, Nita, uh, thanks for being here. And also, um, I want to turn it over to you for a couple of minutes to, uh, to one, thank you and Cherry Becker for sponsoring the event and give us a little bit more uh, details on Cherry Becker and your work there. Absolutely. So, so thank you for sort of inviting me to the panel. So, uh, for those of you who don't know Cherry Beckard, we are um, we're an audit tax and advisory firm. Have been around for seventy five years, and we have about two thousand plus professionals. And we tend to focus a lot on on middle market clients, and we we you know helping them uh, do their audit, their tax, and then helping them figure out what they need to do as as businesses change. 
So for us, we really do believe that the legal industry is going through, uh, you know, a bit of a, is, is likely to go through a bit of a transition as the result of generative AI. And as a firm, we tend to do a lot of work with law firms, with legal techs, with corporate legal departments, and even firms that invest in legal. So this, as we as this topic came up, we felt it was really critical for us to be able to sort of in, to to sponsor this panel. So I look forward to the discussion and and hearing from all of all of you. Thanks, Nita, and thanks again to Cherry Beckert for doing this. So, of course, the the conversation got started back in March uh, of this year when Goldman Sachs released a report that, uh, in the report, estimated that some 44% of legal work could be replaced by artificial intelligence. And I think uh, there was a couple of reactions. One was, uh, oh, no, and the other one was, uh, well, that can't be real. Um, and so, and, and, and I imagine there were a few in between, but the, you know, the eye-opening number underscores why we pulled this panel uh, discussion together today on the impacts of AI in the legal uh, profession. And it's very timely and, and it's very, very important. Um, the report uh, analyzes susceptible various occupations that are, uh, that are subject to automation based on, you know, the complexity of the tasks required. And it found that the legal industry may be uniquely disrupted compared to other sectors uh, with near, again, with nearly half of the legal work potentially being replaced uh, by AI. And while AI is seen as more of a supplemental tool in many professions, uh, it, it rises, uh, you know, substitution risk here in the legal industry uh, for many of the roles that the that lawyers, administrative staff, um, and and legal professionals do. So it this has a profound implication on the workforce and the and the business model of law firms. Um, but like uh, many of the practicing attorneys uh, that we know, we all engage with day in and day out. Uh, we viewed this report with a little bit of skepticism as well. Um, and Ryan McLeod started uh, reaching out a few weeks ago to Toby Brown and myself, wondering what we could do to check the numbers uh, of the Goldman Sachs report. And this soon became a five-way discussion as we brought in Nita and Chris uh, to, to help us with a, a lot of the data and the way that we could be looking uh, and, and take advantage of their expertise uh, that they possess. So, uh, Ryan, since uh, really this was your uh, idea to kick off, would My you mind uh, you know giving us a bit of the reasoning that you started looking at the at this in the conversation that you started with the five of us? Sure, absolutely. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so, yeah, it, most of you have probably never seen this. This is the actual front page of the report. I know when this came out. Uh, in, in in March, I certainly didn't read it. I saw the headlines that looked very much like uh, like what you see here, uh, and uh, and and I thought, yeah, forty four percent. That sounds about right. <laughs> um, I was not terribly surprised by that number, but I also I, I didn't question it. Um, what happened though is uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, generative AI sucked all the air out of every conversation I was having with uh, with law firms uh, on every panel I was on. It was all we could talk about. And this number kept coming back up. Uh, and I heard it coming from people that were selling books. I heard it from people that were selling products. I heard it from people that were selling their consulting services. 44% of something Goldman Sachs says is going to go away. Uh, and I say something because uh, actually, it was reported kind of all over the map uh, in terms of what that something was. Uh, these are just three examples. This uh, this was in the, in the blog post, if you read it. Uh, Law.com said 44% of legal tasks. The Observer said positions. And the New York Times said legal work. So the question became, which is it? Um, and and it, there was one night after dinner uh, I just couldn't help but start pulling on those strings to figure out what did Goldman actually say here, and is it something we need to worry about? Uh, and and about four o'clock in the morning, I stood up from the the computer and and essentially had that first post uh, that I sent to to Greg and Toby. 
Um, so when you go back to the Goldman data, uh, this is this is the infamous chart uh, that they put together showing uh, legal uh, being the uh, number two industry that's going to be affected by this. Um, uh, and, and in fact, you can see from the title, what they were saying is work tasks. So tasks, positions, and, and work are different things, and 44% of them would affect uh, would affect the industry differently. Further confusing the matter is the subtitle, Share of Industry Employment Exposed to Automation. Uh, so what exactly does this 44% mean? It, you know, I, I, give, uh, I give some of the journalists a hard time uh, that, that the reporting was sloppy, but frankly, it was, it was sloppy in here uh, and, and difficult to, to interpret. Uh, the fact that legal pops out uh, made it an easy target to say, uh, this is this is going to be disruptive here, um, but also pointed out in the article. Actually, uh, these are not industries. <laughs> um, uh, you know, office administrative support, business financial operations, management; those are not industries. Uh, and and it, it it you know raised the question: What was Goldman actually looking at? Which I went back to the the original data. The ONET data uh, uh, is a database. It's a very good database, a large database of positions of occupations within the United States. It's a database funded by the Department of Labor. Um, and, and they have, they track based on titles, based on positions. Uh, so they're not actually looking at industries as a whole. They have what they call job families. So when you when they're talking about legal, when Goldman's talking about legal at this point, they're talking about the legal job family that the ONET database contains. And what that means is, in this case, uh, these are the roles, the positions within that database that fall into uh, the legal job family. Now, one of the major ones that's not included here is legal secretaries and administrative staff. Um, they're actually in that very first one, the Office of Administrative Support. So if you add legal secretaries, administrative staff to the legal job family, I'm pretty sure legal is going to pop up uh, and would actually be the top. Uh, but the big, and there's a number of things in the blog post, if you get a chance to read it, that I, I questioned. Uh, and I'm not a data scientist, uh, but I'm pretty good with spreadsheets sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and as you start to dig into it, there's a number of things that would lead you to question some of these results. First of all, they weren't looking at legal specifically. They were looking across the board. And then when you dig down to legal, the sample size is just way too small to make any meaningful uh, determinations on how generative AI is going to affect, uh, affect the legal industry. In this case, they talked to, they have survey data from 31 lawyers. Um, so 44% of work by 31 lawyers, it's it may entirely be accurate, but it's not sufficient sample size to, to say. So that was the primary uh, takeaway uh, from that initial piece uh, that I sent to, to Greg and Toby. And, and that led us to the next question, uh, which is where can we find uh, better data? Um, Make, oh, I'll right throw that work. question right back at you then. Okay. Uh, All right. So, so <laughs> it, Ryan McLeod, if you were the editor of this uh, article, what would you have uh, used as as a more reliable? What What do you think was a more reliable data source to to use here? Well, so that's that's why I went to you <laughs> and Toby, <laughs> uh, and and why you brought in Chris. So. Uh, uh, at the second article that we wrote uh, was taking data uh, that, that Chris provided uh, from CounselWork. Um, and Chris, I don't know, do you want to talk at all about this? Do you want me to talk through it? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start us off and then you can jump in if you want to add to it. So yeah, when um, when you when you initially reached out to me and asked if I might be able to help provide some real data to, to answer 
Um, the question, the fastest way for me to do that was to pick a sample of uh, corporate customers that require all their law firms to bill through CounselLink and actually review the charge lines, um, the, the actual invoices and what they write on the charge lines as to the work that they're billing for and search for those keywords of um, draft and review. Um, and as I guess a little more context, I looked at um, all of 2022. So for the sample of, uh, of customers that I looked at, I looked at a full year's worth of, of billing. And I chose 10 companies um, deliberately of uh, various sizes representing multiple industries to have a good cross-section. Uh, the largest company in that sample has annual revenue in the $150 billion range, and then the smallest is closer to $1 billion, so, and everything in between, so um, a, real good, um, a really good mix of, of sizes of, of companies. Um, I did exclude uh, insurance carriers from the, from the sample because I know from my experience um, in working with them that they generally engage smaller firms to handle most of their, their claims litigation. So I didn't wanna skew the sample. Um, and then um, as to the law firms that these corporations engage, I took a look at that to see what kind of mix was in there, who's, who's actually billing these companies. Six of the 10, um, six or um, seven of the 10 have a, a sizable portion of their fees billed by MLaw 50 firms. So definitely working with the, the heavy hitters. Um, and then the others have the majority of their billing, um, excuse me, their billing coming from MLaw 100 and maybe um, sometimes a smattering of kind of the second 100 firms um, as well. So a good, I think it's a good, a good mix and you can see in Ryan's um, at the bottom of the screen that you're looking at, um, what we saw in terms of um, how many lines, how many charge lines contain those words. So 13% containing draft, 26% containing review, but not draft because there's overlap between those two words or a combined 39% um, of all charge lines that contain one of those two words. So I'll stop. I'll stop there and um, see what else you want to add on to that, uh, Ryan or anybody else. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah, I just a, a question I would assume that would come up in people's mind is, you know, why why draft and review and and you know is that a, a good data set? And uh, on the three geeks, we have something called the we call the three beer rule, which is your smartest after your third beer. And if, as I recall correctly, that's when this uh, idea came to me. Um, but when I thought about it, draft and review are, just seem obvious to me that are tasks that could be displaced by AI. Are we suggesting 100% of them? No. But we're also suggesting this is not 100% of what might be displaced of the types of tasks, you know, redlining, analyzing, assessing. There's a lot of other types of time entries we think um, could easily be included here. So we thought this was a good sort of wrapper, a universe that we could point at and, and look at. So, you know, is this perfect? No. Is it is it more than 31 lawyers? Absolutely. <laughs> so we, we think this is a much better data set. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of come back later on and talk about, you know, if when you're a firm, how would you approach this? Um, but I just, I wanted to point that out because I, just try to get in front of it because everyone's going to go, oh, this is not perfect. No, but this is a much better look than what Goldman Sachs has. Well, and also, you know, I, I, there's a lot that will be left out of here. A lot of what generative AI will do is going to affect administrative tasks that are probably not built. So we're not including that. This is really looking at what are the kinds of things that lawyers do that are going to be affected by this? This is a wide net. Uh, so I think our uh, part of our thinking was this is going to give us sort of a top level how it will affect uh, billing. And, and that's that's sort of the, the the highest end that it could be. Now, what we've said in here in red is optimistically, at least for the near future, uh, it's it's maybe half of that. That's, you know, you at no point, I would argue at no point is generative AI going to do all of that work? 
Uh, but certainly for the in the near future, it's not going to do more than half. That's that's an assumption. Uh, but given that, assuming it actually replaces half of that work, it would replace 20% of the time entries, which obviously then, and, and we're looking at time entries specifically because that's kind of the equivalent of what Goldman was doing. They were talking about tasks. Tasks are translated to time entries. That's how this all came together. But it does uh, raise the, the obvious next question is, uh, okay, well, what does that mean for revenue? Um, and Chris took that same data and looked at the percentage of fees that were billed uh, that those time entries represented. Is that correct, Chris? Did I get that right? It is, yep. So we could look at it either, you know, how many charge lines or fees, which is, you know, really what's going to hit the bottom line of the firm is how much of my fees going to be impacted. So it seemed important to look at that. And we can see that's that's higher, right? It yeah. takes us to 47% from the 39 or 40 that we were looking yeah. at on the previous slide. So yeah, 39% of time entries represent 46%, 47% of fees billed which is where we came up with the assuming the 50% uh, could be done by AI, that would represent 23.5% of revenue. That's where that number came from that I think uh, we we added to our clickbait title for the second uh, blog post. <laughs> uh, how do you come up with 23.5%? Uh, but that's that's where that came from. Anything to add there, Toby? No, and I, that might answer. We've got a, a question up from Deb Garfield at uh, Jacuy. Yeah, okay. Like, I think that answers Deb's question. Yeah. Uh, it's, there are, again, this is not a perfect data set. It's not a large data set. We do think it's at least better than what we were working with with the Goldman data. Uh, and But there are a number of assumptions that need to be made in order to come up with these. Uh, and I think we'll be we'll be careful about telling you what our assumptions are as we go, uh, but feel free to feel feel free to ask us um, as we go through. Uh, so, but that raised the question from Toby. Uh, okay, revenue, that's great. Uh, what does this mean in terms of profitability? Uh, and the key element here is, as we were talking about it, we realized this is going to disproportionately impact non-partner hours in the same way that we said, you know, we're not even including all the administrative stuff that can be done. Um, it's it's actually the, the type of work that is going to be replaced or enhanced uh, or reduced, any of those work uh, by generative AI is going to be the initial drafting, the early uh, uh, review, uh, not necessarily the higher end, more expertise uh, work, uh, which means it's going to affect uh, non-partners more and non-partner work more than it does uh, partners, um, which leads us to how do we evaluate that, Toby? So, and I, Stuart, I see your question there. Um, and I think that is a fair question about quality of time entry narratives, uh, because we know that is a constant pain point for clients when it just says reviewed email. Um, but again, we think with this data set, that sort of comes out in the wash, going to start mixing analogies. And Chris, if you want to lean in on any of that, when you guys look at the data, yeah. does that impact right. what you guys right. Yeah, I mean, it's it is something I noticed. You know, I I, I wasn't able to share the specific um, charge descriptions with all of you because it is confidential um, billing data. But especially the word review is, I think, overused um, by lawyers. Right? I saw things like um, reviewing correspondence, reviewing notes, reviewing budgets, in addition to reviewing substantive legal issues. Right? So. Um, so I, I think that that in particular is uh, maybe maybe um, not the greatest quality of narrative when I see so much of that word review popping in where I'm not sure that would have been the most descriptive thing. But um, but but I do I, I, but I support what you know Toby you and Ryan are saying that that's why we take the total of 
almost 50% down to 25%, right? We know that there's some, um, that we can't completely rely on those narratives. Thank you. Um, so turning the corner, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a uh, very short law firm profitability 101 here. Um, and, and profit is generally revenue minus costs. So what you're seeing here is a sample matter. Um, and you see how many hours were worked by each timekeeper see what their standard rate was. Um, we're, we're not assuming a 100% realization here. We're not, so this, this view is not super detailed, but you'll see that like the equity partner with their hours, they generate 70,400 in revenue. Um, the real twist here, there are, when you're determining law firm profitability, what you're doing is saying, these hours generated this much revenue and they cost a certain amount. So those are called cost rates. So for each timekeeper, it's their effective rate, which is their collected rate <clears throat> minus the cost of the hours, which is a combination of their compensation and overhead. And that equals the profit in dollars. In this model, the equity partners, that's always a challenge in law firm profitability is how you treat their direct cost, which is their compensation, because some of their compensation could be viewed as, you know, for the labor, for the time they work, and some could be viewed as profit or, you know, generally around the originations they've, they've created. In this scenario, we're treating all equity partner comp as profit. And we do that, and I have a number of ways of modeling that. In this model, I can do that and transform this into a profit per equity partner number, which what this baseline scenario is saying, if all the work at the firm looked like this matter, the average pet for the firm would be 2.7 million per partner. Um, we're also assuming in here about a two to one leverage. Um, and we'll change that. Or we can talk about what happens when we change that. But so what you're seeing here is just a very basic here's a matter, here's the revenue, here's the profit that is generated. So going back to Ryan's point about, we think this will um, disproportionately impact non-partner time. And in, in profitability parlance, what that means is, is the leverage is going to be impacted. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, and again, we've simplified this a bit, but typically a 10th year associate will have the biggest margin as a percentage. So that's where profit gets generated. Equity partners don't generate profit. You know, it's the old, you know, capitalism thing, workers work and owners benefit. So what, what will happen with that is if we are negatively impacting the leverage, we're negatively impacting the portion that generates profit. And this is very important because obviously we're going to see a reduction in revenue, but what is going to happen to profit? So let's go to the next slide here, Ryan. So what we did, um, we came up with a few scenarios. And in this scenario, the 5%, 20%, what that means is 5% of partner time, partner tasks, I gotta be careful here, gotta use Ryan's more precise terminology, partner tasks would be displaced and 20% of non-partner tasks would be displaced. And we think that's a, you know, if you look at 12, 24 months, that's not an unreasonable uh, assumption. So it's probably on the lower end based on the numbers we saw from our data. So what, what happens in this scenario? Well, the revenue does go down. And we see a 13% drop in the revenue, but the profit also goes down. Um, profit goes down in absolute dollars by 11%. But more importantly here, remember how we transform this into a, a profit per equity partner number is that the PEP number went down from 2.6 to 2.4, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so it dropped 6.7% because a law firm might look at this and say, well, we'll just go win more work or we'll, we'll reduce our costs. In, in these scenarios, the cost per lawyer, the cost per 10th year and the cost per seventh year is, you can't drive that down unless you pay them less and give them less support. So their cost per hour won't go down. Yes, you can have fewer of them overall at your firm, but what that means are, is that fewer of them are generating profit. So 
even if this firm goes and wins more work just like this, there's going to be less money in the partner profit pool to pay partners. So now am I suggesting that, you know, everything's going to remain the same? I might actually <laughs> suggest that because we know that partners are just going to want to keep doing work the way they do it. And from what I'm hearing around is a lot of the use cases with this are, are just a partner or a practice or some small group saying, hey, I want to try this. They haven't looked at this. And so they're going to they're gonna just keep practicing the way they practice, but their associates are going to have fewer tasks to do. So I do think this is a real possibility. Now, over time, of course, firms can adapt. But I, you know, of all the numbers I've, that we've sort of surfaced through this dialogue and discussion, this minus 6.7% should be the most concerning for law firms. Now we can go, let's go to the, the bigger scenario. We wanted to say, what if, you know, what if in three, four, five years, although nowadays it seems like that a year is every week, um, you, you see the PEP number go down 10 and a half percent. So the more, the more this impacts your firm, or, or the more you adopt this, the more it's going to impact your profitability. Now, I had actually a good friend of mine, and I'm assuming she's on here, say she, she finally was happy with her firm because she's at a, like an AMLA second hundred firm, maybe a midsize, you might describe it as that, because their leverage is one-to-one. -one. Now, in a scenario where the leverage is one-to-one, -one, actually, there is not a, an impact on the PEP number. Uh, I use the two to one for that initial, for our initial scenario here, because that's about average for an AMLA 100 firm. Uh, and I tried to use like averages in terms of cost rates and billing rates and stuff like that to come up with these numbers. So depending where you are in the stack, it can have obviously different impacts. The, the one to one leverage, and I have, I have some bad news for my friend, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it next week at Ilticon. What's happening if you have a firm, and there are a lot of mid-sized firms are one-to-one -one leverage, and what that means is there's probably one partner for every non-partner, whereas at large firms, it's usually about two to one. In these scenarios, when a profit person talks about it, it's not in head count, it's in hours. So if you are a mid-sized firm and you do have one-to-one -one leverage by title, what's very likely happening is one of two things. One is your partners are part, some of your partners are part of leverage. And actually in this model, that services partner with 17 years, they are part of leverage. So if you started displacing their tasks, it would start having the same impact as it has in a, in a larger firm with two to one leverage. The other thing I might say is it, it, it could also be partners doing more associate level tasks, but that, that actually, might be what a client wants. They prefer to have a partner or an associate. I just want to make the point that it doesn't matter where you are in the stack. I see this eventually chewing away at your profit because it's those, the worker tasks are where profit gets generated. Now I'm going to pause there. Um, there's no more slides, right, Brian? Okay. Oh, that's it. I, I want to open it up first to the to our group here to get reactions, especially you Nita, but also Chris, Ryan and Greg um, to, to our scenarios and what we see happening in profitability. So I'd like to add to this. So what I think this means is that, that whichever way we look at this, using generative AI is going to impact the profitability of law firms. So in such a scenario, it's gonna be critical to understand by practice area, what your profitability looks like. And this is going to become increasingly critical because there's going to be, and as we've talked about tasks kind of driving, which are the, the, which can get automated more. So it's going to need to understand in each of your practice areas, which are the tasks that could generative AI could impact, what's that going to mean? And so it's thinking about it more from a practice perspective and then saying what tasks are being performed that would get impacted. So it's it's thinking about this in a fairly different way. And there could be some which like real estate or labor, which are my, they've got consistent contracts, which are which could be automated, et cetera. Those things would be the ones where, and so one, you would have to think about those tasks that could get automated in those businesses. And then what is this gonna mean for how you charge your clients? Because 
this also is saying that continuing to sort of charge by the hour may not be a model that could continue for longer term success, given what we've just said, but the number of hours, especially the junior hours that are going to need to look differently. But uh, and in some practices, it, you will have to have lawyers giving more the more value added tasks. Those those hours would not drop because those are still going to be to be needed. And that's what the you know, the corporate legal departments and the general counsel are going to be looking for. But Toby would like to get your reactions to that. Well, the, the fact is I have put this out to various pricing people, which mm -hmm. I'm a self-described expert in. Was mm -hmm. self-described, Ryan, or was, was that the correct term? Um, they're like, well, we should just go to more flat fees. Mm -hmm. So could you say, instead of billing our, our sample matter, um, could you just fix fee bill that, use the generative AI to reduce your cost, cost of hours, and then actually capture excess profit. Uh, in theory, yes. But I've also bounced this off of some clients, some legal ops people. And mm -hmm. the answer I got from them was, maybe in the short run, we would be okay with that, but eventually, no. And this, is, this goes back to when I first got into legal pricing 15, 16 years ago, everyone's like, oh, well, the, the billable hour is gonna go away. And, and we keep, trying to see that happen but it's it's been very very persistent in its staying power which is why my comment that you know the partners are going to just want to keep doing it the way they do it uh so i yes theoretically if you could go to fixed fees you might be able to recapture some of this but clients mm. they they struggle to go to fixed fees they're very comfortable in fact i had this as a this a conversation with a general counsel of an energy company who basically said, yeah, I don't like fixed fees because I might be paying too much. I know exactly how to deal with hours and discounts and my people have expertise in reviewing bills like that. So could you? Yeah. Um, this might point out where, like, I'll jump ahead. If I were a firm looking at this and saying strategically, where would I want to actually deploy generative AI and not have it gut my, my leverage model and my profitability. I'd probably be looking at existing, if you have them, <laughs> portfolio fee deals. Or let's say you're, you're doing X number of matters on an annual basis and you're doing it on a portfolio fee. That would be an ideal place to deploy this. I don't, based again on the stats, and I, I'm trying to remember, in fact, I know Stuart's on listening, I think the app, you know, the amount of fixed fee billing is in the 20s, maybe 25% at the very top. So what we're talking about is the 75% that's not being fit, being built on fixed fee. That 25%, that's where you should be looking to say, could we do generative AI? Chris, oh. I think you have a have, have more yeah. of a number on that, don't you? I do. Um, so that that is a stat that that I look at in our counseling data every year, and sadly, that percentage is well less than twenty five percent. It's maybe ten to fifteen. So, um, yeah, not the adoption, and that number has barely budged in the last ten years. Thank you, Chris. Also, Chris, I saw a question from Damian Rill, also another wonderful colleague. Props for Sally. Um, he put up, "What if the word analyze were added yeah. in?" And again, Damien, this is why we just stuck with draft and review. We knew there would be other ones. Um, but Chris, would you have a sense of how many time entries begin with her? Well, yeah, I'd be, I'd be guessing it is a pretty common word that we see out there, but, it, but it's also a word that's used in conjunction with review and draft. Like, so those three words could all be in the same charge description. So it may already be picked up, but it would certainly add to, it would, it would increase our, our percentages for sure if we included analyze and some other words as well. So I think arguments could be made, say, oh, we think it's less, but arguments could be made. I think Damien's putting out there that it could be yeah. a lot. And, and so what I would say is why not think about just for the technology piece, start charging it in a different way. And I know that a lot of knowledge businesses do that. You say there's a technology fee, we're gonna be using that, that piece of it. You could sort of charge a flat fee for that part, but for anything which the, which pro, where you're providing legal insights. So it's going to be thinking about this in a slightly different way where it's like it's not a total flat fee, but maybe sort of some kind of a hybrid. So and that would require sort of thinking a little bit outside the box. 
Ryan, I'm curious of any reaction that you have. This. Yeah. Well, I was just going to add, uh, there's a, a question from Rachel Brocard. Uh, have you factored in increased cost of tech in your profitability numbers? Uh, <laughs> no, in fact, and it's a, it's a good point, right? So in fact, you're looking at adding, uh, a, in some cases, a significant cost hmm. uh, that's just going to bring that profitability down even further. Uh, but our numbers did not even look at that. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a valid concern. I building on my my profitability analysis. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, part of what we think firms should be doing is an ROI look at this stuff, because I understand <laughs> that shall remain unnamed, that there's a certain product out there that everyone is, is playing with right now and that it's quite expensive. Um, I, I'm guessing very few, if, if anyone has done an ROI to say, if we're going to spend this much money on a technology platform, is it going to win us? A, will, will we win more work because of it? Because that at least get us revenue back. But B, would it generate higher profit revenue? Um, Nita and I, this is sort of what we talk about a lot. That's a, that's, those are questions that should be asked. Law yeah. firms shouldn't be making it, these decisions in a vacuum. But we all know that law firms don't typically <laughs> include profitability in their decision making. Um, to give you a couple of more variations on this. So, Anita, I want this is going to get pitched back to you. So, I'm giving you a forewarning here. So, I'm, I'm a total profitability nerd. And so, I started running different scenarios based, I took that baseline model. I changed leverage in both directions to say what would happen if the leverage were better to start off and what would happen if the leverage were worse to start off. Um, and as you might expect, although this is counterintuitive to every law firm partner I've ever spoken to, the better leverage one actually takes a bigger hit. Mm. Because again, we're gutting the profit engine of the engagements. So if if you're, and I always, I feel bad about the poor labor people because I always kind of pick on them. So if, if you're a labor practice, you should have, and you probably do have better leverage. If you have like an M&A practice, you probably have less leverage practice. So if you run the profit on those, you get you have different outcomes. So you might look at it and say, well, maybe we then should be investing more in the M&A. And maybe you should, but you should you should have that as an active, explicit, you know, decision that you've made and not just, oh, we, you know, in fact, I'm I'm betting that the labor groups are probably getting a bigger set of use cases with this type of technology because they have repetitive tasks and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But I'm also betting that the firms haven't really looked at, at the, you know, the profit analytics. So Nita, your, your reaction? So no, I, I mean, I agree with you. So in fact, it's going to require almost thinking about this is like, and so when we say when you should do this, you need to look at people, process, technology, and culture. So looking at it in a holistic fashion. So look at each of your practices. What are the tasks that they are doing? And this is how they're doing them today. Which one of these tasks could be automated? And then it's like, who needs to do that task? Because right now they mean, and we, if you think about generative AI, where we're talking about, you know, somebody else maybe drafting a contract, if you could have generative AI do it, it's already going to be, you know, 80% there. That, that means it could, it could also make the, the lawyers more effective. So it's thinking about what that's going to mean from that perspective. So first look at the processes and then actually say, okay, this is how they're done today. How can they get be done differently? Then as we talked about the technology, okay, what technology would make the most sense? What's the cost associated with that? And what's the returns we're going to get? Because that's going to become increasingly critical. So it's, it, and you have to do that, not just one practice doing it, because if you're bringing in the technology, you're going to need to think of it from a law firm perspective, the entire firm using it. Because if you just continue doing silos, you will not get the benefit of it. And you have to say from, a, from the people perspective, like who will do this task? Do they need to be, you know, if it was a 10th year associate, can it, or can it be done by somebody who's more junior, who's less expensive? Or will you need people with different skills? Because that might be, you might need more people with more data analytics skills. That might be more critical, just given the data is going to become more important. And then at the end of the day, the key is to also remember that you could have the best technologies, et cetera, but until you bring the people along and, and no offense, lawyers are kind of always going to be a little bit resistant 
to adopting new technologies, it's kind of bringing them along on the journey and kind of saying, what does this mean for you? Why would this benefit you? And then actually sort of give them all the skills that they're gonna need to use that more effectively. And if you don't, if you miss out any one of these, you're not gonna be effective. So it cannot be done piecemeal. You need to, and it, you know, so you need to think about it from an overall law firm perspective. And then, and, it, and so it come, needs to come from the top down as to how you would approach this. So Chris, I'm now gonna cue up something where I want, want your reaction to it. Um, I, I have a saying and the saying is, I don't care what the question is, the answer is better leverage. Um, and what that is, I'm always telling firms when I'm counseling them, you know, you should always be looking to see how you can move work down, and this is the economist in me, to the most appropriate lowest cost resource. But we all know that the law firm model is built in a way that discourages that from happening. And I think that an obvious reaction here would be to say, well, obviously the law firms are going to have to improve their leverage to retain that profit generating portion of their firm. Uh, I, I would suggest there's probably tons of low hanging fruit, but the challenge is, is that the economic incentives within a law firm, I'm stating something obvious here, but I want to put it on the table, are to move work to its most expensive labor cost resource. Partners want their hours, and that's why part of our assumption was they're going to protect their hours, and which would mean that disproportionate hit on leverage. But it's also associates and counsel. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to them. In fact, there was, I'll give you an example. This was at a former firm, uh, like a ninth year counsel had moved into a non-partner track. And he came to me and said, I love my job better now because the billable hour pressure was off of him because he had a different kind of compensation. And he basically looks at, oh, it's awesome. I, he goes, normally I would have kept all these tasks. He goes, I'm, now I'm, I'm delegating them down to where they should be. So the associate's compensation is the same way, that the 10th year is going to hold everything they can, and then they'll give something to the seventh years and then on to the third years. So I think there's a lot to be done to gain that, but it's going to be challenging in the law firm you know, financial models because they incentivize the opposite behavior. So Chris, from the client side, and from, I, I know you go deep on a lot of this data. I have to assume clients would favor that. Um, does the data really play out that tasks could be moved down, but aren't? So, yeah, I was going to chime in on this when you were talking about the fixed fee idea of being able to increase profitability by, you know, charging a fixed fee that includes some, a good bit of work that AI is, is doing or, or doing part of. Um, I think it depends on one, one thing that, that nobody mentioned, and so I am speaking from the, my corporate client um, hat perspective, a savvy general counsel is going to say, I expect that type of work that the fixed fee will decrease over time as you get more and more efficient in how you're doing it, right? I don't expect you to be increasing my fixed fees. I, in fact, I'll, I'll monitor them and see that they're dropping. So I do know a, a couple of GCs that are kind of at that level, and that's how they think about the fixed fee model. That it should be it should be incentivizing um, better leverage, and that should come through in, in their costs as being as being reduced. So um, I don't know if that answered your your question, Toby, but that's what you know in terms of what I think that general counsels are going to expect. I think that they're thinking about all this as an efficiency play that. And, and to that, what I'd like to add is that the key to think about is why people are going to lawyers because of the legal advice that they provide and all the capabilities and knowledge that they bring. And so in some ways, even within the law firm, there needs to be that kind of a thinking that that kind of thing, nobody else can replace that all the other tasks probably get automated. So it almost logically would make sense that for those parts, you can charge more where you're providing legal advice, but for everything else, Think about if you're using more technology, start thinking of a fixed technology fee that you can charge saying, we're gonna be using that and then charge for your people. But it's it actually an entirely different way of thinking of how your business model needs to operate. And that's gonna be the big shift. But this, and you're right, because the GCs are not gonna to wanna to continue to pay say 500 bucks an hour for somebody to create a draft. If a machine can do that in like, or you know, can help, can help you do that in like five minutes. 
That's the most logical answer. Well, we, we kind of have a precedent for that. If you look back in the late 90s to early 2000s, uh, the same model was used when Westlaw uh, or Lexus came in and instead of reviewing the books, then there was the technology uh, and the, the whole concept was this is going to speed up the ability for the attorneys to do research. Therefore, you're going to be paying less in number of hours, but you're going to be paying for a fee for using of the technology and that technology uh, it was Westlaw Lexus. Now that has diminished over time. Um, so do you guys see that as uh, a, you know, Nita, is that kind of a model that you're looking at or uh, would you would you phrase it a different way? So I would not phrase it in that way, because what I'm saying is if you're actually then freeing up your lawyers, then you can actually think about what other and, and you've got all this data. What other insights can you provide to your clients? So it's almost taking a slightly different thing, whereas you're just doing a case and you're sort of and let's assume you're doing an M&A deal and you're, and you're providing on that. Then if you've got all the data, then you can say what other information I could provide to them but you can actually charge for it. So if you start thinking about what products you could create that could be giving them, but actually adds more value to your clients. So, so thinking of your role, not just as I'm doing this case and this is how much I charge, but trying to be that trusted advisor to be able to provide them with more information to help them run their business more effectively. So it's thinking what else are they going to be needing? And so I think that's the sort of shift that might be needed because that's what we're finding that clients are like, well, my work, my general counsel's work is getting to be more complex. They would, they would actually welcome this kind of advice if you understand my industry and have more information and you can provide me more insights and say, this is what it means for your business. I would absolutely value that. And that's what we've heard from our general counsel, that you're almost putting yourself in my shoes and answering some of that information. So we have, I've been trying to monitor the Q&A thing here, Greg, and we've got a lot of I think good questions. Yeah. Um, maybe we take a moment to go through some of those. Um, yeah, I I got a way to kind of combine a couple of them with with some anecdotes. I've I've been on uh, the podcast this year. Have been interviewing. In fact, there's people on the comments here that I've interviewed. Uh, that uh, uh, and so there's two things that I've heard anecdotally that, but I've, I hear them again and again, and I think this will knock out a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, I interviewed uh, Darth Vaughn from Ford. And one of the comments that he said is don't worry about the, you know, the work going away that you're churning through the work I'm giving you. He's like, trust me, I've got lots of more work that I would love to give you if I could afford to do it and I had the time. And so his thought was, if we use the technology to you know, reduce the amount of time it takes to go through the work that's already out there, then he's got a backfill ready to go. The other that I, that I think is kind of the flip side of that same coin is law firms have invested in technology uh, you know, for the past two, three decades. And there is a lot of underutilized technology out there that law firms already own that because of the hype around generative AI, you may have someone coming to you and saying, look, I want to apply, you know, uh, chat GPT, because that's what everybody calls it. Uh, I want to apply chat GPT to, you know, X, Y, and Z of my work. And really what the conversation leads to is like, hey, we've already purchased a really good tool that you're not using that could be more efficient and not be handled by ChatGPT. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, one, do you think that, that uh, in, in-house, and maybe Chris, you can, you, you may know, have insight on this, do they have a, a, a way to backfill if you start knocking out their work more quickly? Uh, you know, some take that for what it is. And then two, do you think the the artificial or the uh, the generative AI is just one piece of the efficiency tool that all of this other stuff that we've been buying for the last five, 10 years is suddenly going to actually come into play and may even uh, you know speed up or or make it more efficient? 
Um, well, I can actually take a little bit of that in that uh, coming from the technology perspective, uh, that's a great outcome. <laughs> if your lawyers are coming to you saying, hey, I want to use GPT for this or whatever they're calling it. Um, and you say, actually, we've got a document automation tool that's going to give you exactly what you want every time if you answer these questions. That's the right solution. And that's good. Uh, they should have been using that all along. And part of what I've seen, what the difficulty is going to be, is they come to you and say, hey, I want this magical AI. And you say, okay, well, I've got this earlier version of what could be considered AI. <laughs> and it's not nearly as sexy, but it will do exactly what you want. And they're like, eh, I don't really care. I don't want to do that, right? It's that you're going to fight that. Uh, but that's actually, that's a better outcome because GPT and generative AI in general has a lot of flaws. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of benefits to it. And I'm not down on the technology at all. I love the technology. It's a lot of fun and it's very capable and makes a lot of things easier and faster. Uh, but, and we, we know about things like uh, hallucinations, right? And, and we know about the problems with hallucinations in terms of uh, uh, pleadings and things, cit citations, but it's even more pedestrian than that. Uh, if you are working with the technology and you're typing in a, uh, a request, I want it to do these things on this uh, selection of text, this transcript, and you ask for a date that the transcript happened, but that particular one you pasted didn't contain a date, it makes one up. So there's an element of, <laughs> of all of this information is still going to have to be vetted and confirmed and no matter how minute. Um, so to take it all back to, to our, our beginning consideration of percentage of work that's going to be replaced, it will make it much faster to do some of those initial things. There's still a whole lot of work that needs to be done by a person and frankly cannot be done by a computer uh, at this point, maybe ever, um, uh, probably not never, but not in the near future. Uh, that is, is going to be, instead of doing that initial drafting, you're going to be spending an hour confirming that that initial draft is not BS. Right. Um, so it, it changes, changes the technology changes the work that way. Absolutely. And it's going to be that the lawyers will be enabled by the technology so that it makes them more efficient. So that then they're like, it, and maybe it gets them say 80 percent there. And and then you can then they would have to do the remaining to make sure, like you said, that there's no errors, et cetera. And I think from a law firm perspective. So when you think about what this means from a law firm perspective is you probably need it within your firewalls to make sure it has your information. So you're not just getting random information from outside. But what this is also going to require, which is also a different way of thinking, which people who do sort of innovation, et cetera, always think about, you're going to need to experiment and, and not do it live, but you know, create like a sandbox, experiment to see what level, and then there might be something that doesn't do right, but you'd have to then, add, which means you have to also be willing to fail fast, which is something that lawyers are not very okay with. In fact, a lot of because you're so happy to be correct on everything, but that's going to require a different kind of a mindset as to how do you experiment and make sure what you get at the end is correct. And there is no other way around that. You have to educate the AI and make sure it's giving you the correct information. I, I, I totally agree with Nita. Uh, in, in, the importance of experimentation. Hmm. I think to, to Greg's point with the earlier technology, um, one of the questions I ask, first of all, is do you need it to be the same every time? Hmm. Right? If you need it to be the same every time, document automation. We could do that every single time, exactly the same language, exactly the same format, everything. If you want some element of creativity, hmm. then let's look at generative AI. Yeah, um, agree. Because if you run generative AI, the same exact information 10 times in a row, you get 10 different variations on the same answer. Um, and if and that's often not what lawyers want. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's a, a bit of education needs to take place around that. This is not document automation magic. This is creative and it's going to give you something slightly different every time. So, so I think this kind of comes back to what is the law firm supposed to do? Because I know we talk about it and we get very caught up with the technology. It actually is going to require somebody at a firm level saying, this is what we want to do. So it's 
it's going to almost require you to kind of say, okay, here's where, what's happening in the outside world. What are we doing? Where do we want to go? It's so almost creating like a roadmap of this is what we're doing. We get to the level of understanding which task can be automated and say, here's where we are. Here's where we want to go. And then executing on that. So which means it's going to require some kind of a coordinated approach. Somebody who's going to be saying, I'm going to be responsible to make sure across the entire farm that we, we actually do this in a very focused manner and then be able to say, okay, now we will test this. We'll experiment on it. And then we bring in the lawyers and say, hey, can you check, test this out and see how this works? That's going to require bringing people along. So it's so you have to think about this in that fashion where technology sounds exciting, but you're going to have to bring all of the people so that they know what to do with the technology. Like you just said, Ryan, it's not going to be a firm just introduces and everybody's going to know what to do with it. But it's And it's going to require to be done in a very systematic fashion and driven almost by somebody at the top. Greg, I see you, you've got a question you're ready to answer. I got a couple too, so go ahead. Well, I was going to ask Chris to follow up on the, is is there going to be a backfill of demand if we start becoming you know, very efficient and are able to take something that may take you know 10 days to, to do and push that down into one day? Yeah, right. Um, I, what comes to mind is a, um, a customer at a large um, financial services organization that I've worked with who, um, who from the day that I met her talked about how important it was to her that her lawyers were doing meaningful work, right? Mm -hmm. That she, how important it was to, to remove or find efficiencies where it was possible um, and then be able to find more challenging and interesting work for them to step into. So I think the point's already been made that, um, there is additional work there. There is there's more challenging, more interesting, more strategic types of things that lawyers can do to backfill um, their time. If if indeed it does, um, if AI starts to replace it. Yeah. I, Greg, I, the, one of the questions I saw up there is uh, from where did it go now? Well, it was on um, about in house the in house side that. Could yeah. their in-house tasks displaced? And from what I, when I talk to people, I think it depends a lot on the in-house uh, approach. Like if a legal department sends everything outside or if they bring a lot inside and it depends on what they bring inside. And Chris, you could comment on this. From what I understand, what I've seen with clients, they do the more basic stuff inside, the more bread and butter stuff. So obviously that could be disproportionately impacted. Mm. We're talking more about law firms right now because my sense is legal departments are very interested in this. They don't have the kind of budget a law firm has. And I've even talked to legal ops people who have said, we're going to kind of watch and see what law firms do and then decide what we're going to do. I actually think if, if a legal um, department made big investments here, they could reduce a lot of FTEs. But Chris, I, what's your... Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a great point. I was going to bring that up that, um, that the larger larger legal departments generally do have a technology roadmap and somebody who's driving that. And a lot of them are making big investments in technology and they're going to invest in AI, right? But, but that's going to be the larger organizations. So yeah, will that reduce um, some of the work that their people are, are doing? Probably, but it also then opens up the possibility that they'll bring more, more work in-house that mm. they were sending the outside counsel, right? That they're going to bring in the work that, or, or the specific tasks associated with certain types of matters that they believe that they can begin to handle in-house. So, I mean, I would think that that would be the way that um, they can that they can demonstrate um, or, or prove their ROI or the investment on that technology that, yeah, they, they're going to reduce the some of the work that's being done in-house, but they're also going to pull it out of um, away from outside counsel. Yeah, okay, I've got a question from Michelle about could I show the other charts? Um, no, because they're way more complicated. But what I can say is and I'm assuming the question here is with better leverage uh, versus worse leverage, it moves that that hit on profitability by about a half a point. So if we're better leverage, it's a half a point worse, bigger hit on profitability. With worse leverage, it's about a half a point less hit on profitability. There's that piece. And then I have a question here from Porvi, um, fellow LVN board member, uh, about the potential impact on clients' willingness to accept first-year or junior associate 
um, time on a bill. Um, I actually think this is a place you can use generative AI. And I think it was, I want to say Oric, might've been Fenwick. Sorry if you're on here and I've missed name this. They're using this to teach their associates. This is a, a great tool to teach people to say, okay, here's how you should have written <laughs> this. Or here's, you know, if you want to gain knowledge quickly and gain, gain skill quickly, generative AI is a fantastic tool to do that. And then it, you're actually deploying it in a way where you're advancing your lawyer's skills faster and making them more valuable more quickly. So that you should start thinking outside of, oh, this is going to take just, you know, document drafting away from associates. You, you can use it as an additive tool. Um, and Nita, I don't know if you have any reaction on that. Of, of other sort of non-legal tasks. Yeah, so I agree with like Chris, where you were saying that the big firms can actually like they would invest in technology and be able to sort of you know maybe bring in more tasks in house. I would actually say that for the for the next year, which is not the ones who've got these big huge budgets, I would not be surprised if somebody came with a with a platform focused on legal and actually be able to say, hey, you can come in and use our system, which we've already created, which is a generative AI, to be able to test it because, and then, you know, use our system and our platform, because I think that's what the future of this platform plays. So I think it's not just the big guys who have the money, but there's going to be the next level who's also going to be thinking about that. Yeah. So I think from a law firm perspective, it, it, they have to sort of think about this change is going to happen. And so they have to decide, it's almost like, do I want to be in control of this or do I want this to happen to me? And I think what we are all suggesting is take a proactive approach, understand where your profit is coming from, where it could get impacted, what you should be doing, what should you be thinking about in terms of how you actually then think of different models to charge your clients, depending on how the work is being done. And then make sure that your people understand this, bring them along on the journey, because we, I, we've always seen this, that the people who are doing the work are the best ones to say, hey, where else could we use this? Make sure that they're thinking about this in that fashion and saying, oh, yeah, we're just using it right now to, to use it for something else that we may not have thought about. And that could be so that they are thinking about it in that fashion as well. So I think that's where I see this going. And it's almost like, do you want to be in control or do you want this happen to you? And I think we're all kind of saying, you guys are going to need to do something. So I want to, I'm going to pick this up. And, and Rachel has asked a second question, and it's, I'm going to call it a softball question. Um, so if you remember when Ryan put up the Goldman industry list, um, which really wasn't an industry list, numbers one, four, and six were actually the back office of a law firm. Hmm. So Nita and I've talked about this a lot. We've talked about it with this group. If I were a law firm and I were deploying generative AI, I might not start with lawyer tasks. Hmm. And, and my good friend who still shall remain nameless, who's in, who's in marketing, the one where I talked about the one-to-one -one leverage, um, I see a lot of applications in marketing. Uh, so to, to answer your question, is there, the question is, what are thoughts and potential technology to reduce other law firm costs? One that we've surfaced as a potential use case would be um, writing RFP responses. You know, and I'll use Nita's um, metric of 80%. If you could get it to 80%, um, that would be, that could save a law firm a lot of time and money. There's a lot of expense that goes into drafting RFP responses. A lot of, this, this is my economist, a lot of unproductive, very expensive partner time goes into drafting those responses. Uh, you could use it for that. You could use it to generate bios. You could use it to generate blog posts. You know, of course. And take it further other operations, like why do you need to have a whole finance department? Like you have your CFO and you might have all the, maybe think about whether that could be outsourced. The marketing things, if generative AI can do more of that. So then start thinking of all your other areas which you might don't need to have in-house. And I'm saying this, and I'm not saying these are all the right ones, but they're, the think about this then technology support, like you're gonna need, do you need that in-house? There's enough firms that provide technology outsource services for law firms, maybe that's one thing. To, so it's actually started looking at all your areas where, where you're spending your money and saying, which one of these do we need to keep in-house? Is it better to outsource it to somebody who's an expert? Security and privacy, which is really big. 
do we and there's experts who do that can we use them would that be cheaper to do that but others we might get a, a second quality person or a lower quality person we have to hire somebody in-house whereas we could get the experts doing that outside so it's actually yes there's huge amount of potential if you think about it from a business perspective and say the real value what we bring keep that in-house what are, are the opportunities to streamline all the other processes automate them outsource them and then take it from there I want to I want to bring it down again a little bit <laughs> um, <laughs> because uh, there's there's a concept that if if you're not familiar with it you need to learn this term soon context uh, context for generative AI is how much information it can consume and recreate uh, essentially uh, which to Toby's point about uh, writing an RFP. I don't think there's any tool, maybe you could do some of it with uh, Claude, which has a really large amount of context. Uh, uh, the GPT stuff with API uh, is very limited in how much information it can take in at the moment to generate. Um, so uh, most of these tools are much better at smaller tasks. The smaller the task, the smaller amount of information you're giving it, to uh, regenerate or otherwise uh, adjust or uh, change, however you want to think about it, the better it's going to be at that task. When you're giving it large things, just as an example, I've been playing with large transcripts. Uh, there are very few tools that can even summarize those because if it's 60 pages or 120 pages of a transcript, there are no tools that can handle the, the context of all of that information to give you a summary. You have to take it and chop it up and then get summaries for individual parts. So as we're thinking about where can you use this, and this is going to change over time, you're gonna to have to be aware of how that context grows. But uh, right now the tools are not available to allow you to do 120 pages of text uh, summarized for you. So if I, if I might lean in here a little bit, and I, I like this where this is going, Ryan, one of the things, well, let me do a, a Gen AI 101 ish sort of statement here. I have a background in e discovery, and in e discovery, it, it, machine learning is a predecessor to generative AI. I'll put it that way. And machine learning is where humans teach the technology, you know, this, this answer was correct, this answer was bad. And you'd go through five or six training cycles in an e-discovery process, and then it, it was trained up and you could turn it loose on all of the discovery data. With generative AI, the difference is humans don't do the training, information does, content does. A training might be too strong of a word. I'm looking at your face, Ryan, but it's <laughs> that's how it that's how it works. So yeah. So something you should be thinking about, if I were a firm and I was preparing myself and said, what do I need to do right now in order that as this wave strikes, I am prepared to deal with it? Well, Ryan was giving some examples of larger documents, but you know, I'm gonna make a general statement here. I think it's defensible. All law firm data is crap. Hmm. Um, because the metadata is is garbage, and now we're going to get a brief Sally commercial. Um, what firms should be doing right now is fixing their data. And thankfully, guess what? Generative AI is really good at. <laughs> if you took the Sally codes, in fact, we do have a tool that's available free on the Sally site that you can take any data and basically code it, programmatically code it to the Sally codes. So if I were a firm, I'd be wanting, that would be probably a number one spot where I would be saying, I'm going to start cleaning up my data, whether you want your own very custom personal taxonomy or you leverage the Sally standard, either way, cleaning up your data, because and I'll bring it back to the example. Let's say, and I'm going to throw out a use case, you want to use this for drafting motions for summary judgment. You got to be able to get to the the pool of motions for summary judgment that are in your DMS. And we all know the quality of the metadata in most law firm systems is not great. So to prepare, think now about how you would structure or how you would clean up your data to prepare for that. And Nita, I know you and I talked about this. That, that's a big one. There are other ones. Lean in however you want to on that comment. 
I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying that the, the data is actually going to become incredibly critical. And like you, I, and I, you said this and then not me that the data, most law firms don't have good data because as we move forward on using AI, generative AI, it's going to become incredibly critical to have good data. And that's going to be a big lift. And anything where there's fixed standards would actually, and that's what we're using the Stanley standards. I think that's a way to good start, but the cleaning the data, there is no other way around it. Because I'm sure you must have heard of the saying, like data is going to be the new oil. It's going to be that critical for businesses, for, for law firms to run their businesses more effectively. I, in fact, I'm going to pick up on that. But everyone likes to say data is a new oil, but try using a 55-gallon uh, drum of crude oil to do anything. <laughs> you have to think beyond, you know, it is, yes, it is oil, but oil needs to be refined and <laughs> processed yeah. and everything yeah. it has value. So that's why I would go to the data cleanup. So Ryan, yeah. I Kind of pitch it back to you. I don't know in terms of what use cases you've been saying. And well, uh, use cases uh, are all over the map. Um, I, I do think smaller is better. So when you're talking about having it code your time entries to Sally, uh, that that's great. This tiny little bits of text that it's going to analyze and can give you a, a code. That that makes a lot of sense. Larger chunks of test text. Uh, become problematic because of the context. Uh, the the Claude 2 uh, tool that's come out has 100,000 uh, uh, tokens it can handle. Uh, it gets complex and tokens what that means, but uh, essentially it's a lot of words, um, uh, but it's not infinite. So, you know, you have to, you have to look at what you can actually do with the tools uh, because because they're not magic and they don't just take whatever you give it and generate something for you. Um, uh, in terms of use cases, um, you know we've seen we've seen a, a lot of them. Uh, I've seen a lot more that it actually isn't capable of. What people know about it, uh, they they immediately begin to extrapolate. It's it's exactly the same thing we've seen with every other type of AI. Oh, machine learning. Well, I'm going to just have it do this for me. No, it doesn't work that way. You really need to understand what the tools do, what they're good at. Uh, more importantly, with this one, different than the others, uh, or uh, you have to be able to talk to it in a way that it understands and in a way that is valuable, that will help you get what you want out of it. Uh, so yes, questions. it's yeah. a chat tool. So yeah, you can just talk to it. But if you want to get something specific out of it, you have to be very specific. You may have to enter, you know, 3000 words of information, which it, most of them will choke on, mm -hmm. but uh, you need to be able to enter a lot of information to get very specifically what you want out of it. And even then, depending on what the settings are, it kicks in with randomness and you're not going to get exactly what you want. So uh, use cases are an ongoing uh, ongoing exploration, I think. Let's understand uh, the limitations of the technology because I know people get so excited about any technology. It's like, oh, it's going to do this and it's going to do that until the practicality of it is, is you have to, so you have to recognize that. And I think even with generative AI, we're still in the early stages. That's lots more it's going to be able to do, you know, as it gets smarter. But right now, just remember that, that we're still very much in the early stages. Yeah. And I, I wanted to tackle a couple of uh, questions, uh, one from Jordan and one one from Elaine. Uh, Jordan uh, basically brought up the fact that with, uh, use the example of RFPs, that, uh, and I, I think he's a little tongue in cheek in this, but I think that there is actual practicality in this is that, you know, you're going to be given information that was basically generated with with artificial intelligence and then you're going to reply to that information uh with artificial intelligence but quite frankly that's not anything new um we kept a standard list of answers because we know we're going to be answering you know the same question over and over again and so we've normalized how we uh answer rfps if we get certain questions um, the other question was uh, from Elaine uh, that talked about how, uh, how, and I'll expand it a little bit, information professionals, law librarians, KM 
folks, uh, there was a very similar article that basically said 65% of, of lawyers thought that the KM and library people will just, you know, this will replace uh, what they do. And I think um, actually, and I may, and I am biased in this, um, I think it's actually the opposite because we do need to clean that data. We need to be able to figure out how to interact with the information, how to categorize it, how to normalize it, how to index it, uh, to, to have the metadata, um, because even with the magic of generative AI, uh, we still have the old garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so if you don't have someone there that understands mm -hmm. how these systems work with the information that you're feeding it or that you're inputting into it, um, then I think you just raised your risk, uh, you know, astronomically on that. So um, I, I, I think, again, information professionals, if they approach it the right way, will become invaluable, uh, at least for the for the foreseeable future. And in fact, it will help them become more efficient because it could so it, the same way as we've talked about everything is it'll get them a certain percentage there. So rather than having to do everything from scratch, so it might make them more efficient too. And the better the, you know, the technology gets, the maybe their tasks will get even more. Doesn't mean human beings are going away, like you just said, because their knowledge will still be very valuable, but it'll just make their tasks easier. Sorry, Toby, you were going to say something. I, there was another question here, and it's kind of my sweet spot, so I was going to jump all over it. So right. Nigel posted a question up to the summary of it is, can't law firms just raise their billing rates to offset the cost of this and regain their profits? Um, I, I ran rate setting processes at a couple of large firms. And the answer is no. Um, the market will only bear a certain amount of rate increase. And, and I know every year, Chris can confirm this, all the clients, oh my God, I can't believe law firms are not raising their rates. And every year I'm telling law firms, if you don't raise your rates with the market, you're, you're, you're giving away money. And so the market will set those rates. And I just don't see a lot of, I don't see the market being that adaptive to, because you would have to raise rates significantly, in my opinion, to make up for that lost bit. You know, and even if I just made it very simple, okay, you were going to raise your rates. And this is, I'm not, this is no one's number. <laughs> if you were going to raise your rates 5% this year, you'd have to raise them 11% to try to counteract that. And even that wouldn't fully counteract it because I'm using the 6% we had from the, from that 520 um, scenario. So I, I just don't see the market sucking up for that. And Chris, I'm sure you can chime in about a client's reaction to that. Well, yeah, I mean, clients have, have already been absorbing some pretty big increases. The last two years have had the biggest rate increases that we've seen. So um, if, you, if you're going to build on top of that, I think that GCs are definitely going to be pushing back. Yeah. Um, we've got about five minutes here. Greg, I don't know. If... Well, uh, let me get this uh, question out of the way. Uh, Ryan. How close was Goldman Sachs to being correct after you <laughs> after you broke down the, the data? No idea. Um, no, it's 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 a good question. I mean, I, I think I think it's it's key and important to remember Goldman wasn't looking at the legal industry. Mm. Uh, they were looking at they were looking at economic growth overall across the country, and legal popped out uh, for, in part because. Uh, they, you know, it was it was number two on that chart, and the legal press lost their mind, <laughs> right? Uh, rightfully so. It's a big number, forty four percent, regardless of what it refers to. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know how accurate it is. Um, I, there's, if you, you know, look at the original article, there were a number of things. There's a lot of fuzzy thinking inside that data. I think. Overall, it gives a nice uh, big picture look that, yeah, this is going to have a significant economic impact or more importantly, could have a significant economic impact. I think once you start to dig into individual verticals, the data doesn't support that. You can't really get to that number that way. Uh, but, you know, the entire idea behind this was what can we figure out for the legal industry? 
So it sounds like we're on closing remarks here, Greg. Is that? <laughs> yep, that, uh, that was going to be my thing. Is uh, and Toby, let, let's start with you, and then we'll work around the table here. Um, what, what's kind of your your insights on this, and and what do you think people should be looking out for in the in the near future? Well, I, I absolutely, obviously think that this is going to impact profitability, and I think law firms need to start building profitability into their decision making. And with these types of investments and this type of impact, this is a great place to start doing that. Secondly, also reiterating, get your data cleaned up. Um, if you want to be well positioned at, at all to be able to embrace this and embrace it with your clients, you, your information needs to be cleaned up and clean up, have a data strategy, all those sorts of things. One thing I didn't talk about, I think you need, or I guess a couple of things. One, you need, the cloud is where this is all going to be. So you, if you're not there, you need to define a very clear path to get there. And lastly, you should really be stepping back and looking at all of your, and, and Ryan and Greg have kind of alluded to this, your technology and I'll call them vendor relationships to see how they all fit into this and how they're going to support this going forward. I mean, we we saw um, Nita mentioned in the pre-show that Latera announced that they're going to be adding AI into some of their products. Those sorts of things, you really need to have an eye on your partners to your firms and your legal departments about where they're headed with this. So, and last, I'll say, yeah, you need to get on this page. <laughs> you can't, this is one thing you can't deny and just wait for it to pass by. It, it, it will overwhelm you. So thank you. Greg. Yeah, Anita, uh, faster than Toby did his. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you see? So, so I would add to what Toby kind of said. I think the key is that law firms need to realize that you have to do something and take a systematic approach as to, and so think about this from a business perspective. You cannot say, I'm not going to do anything. I think that's no longer an option for whatever it is you are going to get impacted. So now it's going to be, what should you be doing? Take a systematic approach. And then it's going to, and, and look at all parts of your business, look at your, pra your, your practice areas, the profitability, and then look at like what processes that can be automated to do it very systematically, but you're going to need to do something. Chris, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I certainly echo what, what both uh, Nina and Toby said, and uh, just building upon how important it is to do this by practice area, that, that this is not a this is not a law firm problem. This is a, you know, or, or an opportunity, right? This is going to affect each practice area uh, uniquely. And, and Ryan, final thoughts? Uh, this is exciting technology. Uh, it is not magic. It does not automatically fix anything. Uh, there are uh, a lot of arcane and uh, uh, specific terms that you need to understand if you're going to begin to apply this. Um, and don't just assume that because your vendors are have added it, that it's useful <laughs> or helpful or going to do anything other than raise the cost of their service. And so I want to thank everybody. Uh, if you have questions that you want to follow up with, uh, you can email those to info at legalvalue.network.com, and those will be forwarded to the panel. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time to uh, on the panel itself and for the audience. Um, and I'll part with the uh, the saying that you probably heard a lot is that, you know, AI is here, um, how it affects is to be determined. But the the saying is that, uh, you know, lawyers, law firms, in-house, ALSPs, those who who use uh, or who augment their work with AI will probably benefit more than those who don't. So that's my that's my parting words. Uh, Christian, we'll turn turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar session. This recording of the session will be available on our website in the next two weeks. And we'll see you all at the LVN conference. Thank you. <laughs>